I'm seeing Anisha. Are you looking for a quick getaway to a quaint city where the weather is nice and the ladies are uh, <laughs> as sweet as their iconic confection? This episode is quite special to me because I'm going to take you around my hometown Sukabumi. Back in the colonial days, the city was nicknamed the Wine of Java. Let's find out why. See the beauty only on Sea Indonesia. Sukabumi is a regency in West Java, Indonesia, a landlock at the foot of Mount Gede. It's about 100 kilometers south of the national capital, Jakarta. If you use the Bogor Ciawi Sukabumi toll road, you can easily reach it in around two and a half hours. Compared to the regency as a whole, Sukabumi is very petite. With an altitude of approximately 584 meters, Sukabumi offers a cool and wet climate since it often rains. But did you know that the area around Sukabumi was already settled in the 11th century at the very least? A city historian by the name of Irman Sufi will take me around several important sites that marks the importance of this place in the past. Our history lessons start here, at the Sukabumi City Hall. The area around present-day Sukabumi was first developed in the 18th century, when the Dutch East India Company opened a plantation. It used to be called Gunung Parang with Chikole as the capital. But after Stamford Raffles bought the area in 1811, the name was changed by Andreas de Wilde after he consulted the locals. Suka means happy and Bumi means home, so anyone who visit the place would feel happy as if they are home. The city was established on April 1914, led by a burgermeister or the head of regency. Next site, we went to the western part of the city, specifically the Chikole sub regency where a Protestant church stands. It was built in 1911 and has a treasure that no one would have guessed. The name is Sidang Christus Church, one of the oldest church in the city. Most of the building is still original and it is listed as Sukabumi Heritage Site. The land was given by a famous landowner, a German called A. A. Lene, who also owned the Slabatu and Slabintana hotels. What's special about this church is what's hiding in the tower. I want to see it for myself, so I decided to climb up alongside Mr. Irman. There we found a 107-year-old church bell. Produksinya sama dengan yang di Notre Dame Perancis. Ini dibuat tahun 1914 dan langsung di order dari Eropa khusus untuk di Sukabumi. Nah, ini uh, disebutkan tadi kalau dulu dibunyikan juga Pak ya. Tiap jam 12. Ya, jam 12 siang sama jam 12 malam Jumat. Sekarang mungkin tidak dibunyikan dan dulu ada hubungannya dengan langsung dengan jam yang di atas ya. Oke, okay. kita lihat jamnya juga ya, mungkin ya bang kalau boleh. Kalau kita lihat di angkanya ini ya. Jadi kalau yang di luar itu angkanya empatnya adalah empat buah angka satu itu sama dengan jam gedang. Konon dulu itu permintaan Raja Louis. The clock is actually older than gedang clock, dating back to 1911. This place stands around 100 meters from the Agung Mosque. You can literally see the minaret from the church tower. That's why for many years, these two buildings have symbolized the tolerance of the Sukabumi people. The last stop he's taking me is a facility that was built in 1899. It's called Gudung Juang. This Art Deco building was designed by A.F. Albers and Charles Prosper Wolf Schumacher. Yep, the same Schumacher that designed the Merdeka building in Bandung. 
disinilah uh, dimana uh, para perangle printers juga di, uh, para pekebun itu berkumpul untuk merapkan rapat sekalian melakukan dansa dansi dan hiburan jadi kalau zaman dulu ada Miss Cici pernah tampil di sini Wibenga dari Eropa juga pernah tampil di sini sesudah uh, Jepang kalah ternyata ini dijadikan tempat uh, markas perjuangan sementara jadi tempat yang pertama dilakukan perebutan kekuasaan di Sukabumi itu di sini dan ini sangat strategis dengan alun-alun Nah, karena Sukabumi memang dulu dikenal sebagai Nizafan Java, anggurnya Jawa. Jadi, anggur itu kan memabukan. Jadi, seolah-olah Sukabumi itu bikin mabuk kepayang. Setiap orang yang ke sini itu enggan keluar lagi karena sudah uh, ini merasa betah. When you Google Sukabumi, there's going to be like the most beautiful women in Indonesia in Sukabumi. But now I think I get it because Sukabumi is very multicultural. So nowadays everyone is like a mix of everything. There's a little bit of Chinese, a little bit of Bugis, a little bit of everything, a little bit of European as well. So yeah, maybe that's why. Cities like Singkawang or Semarang were developed by Chinese society living in Indonesia. Sukabumi is one of these cities that flourished from the contribution of Chinese migrants. The proof can be traced here at Widi Sakti Buddhist Temple, located at Bajagalan Street. The shrine has existed since 1908. However, development was temporarily halted due to a cholera outbreak that happened at that time. Fortunately, it was first opened in 1912 with the help from local communities. This table, this table knows everything because the table has already exists since the very beginning of this uh, establishment. The age for that table itself is around 100 years old. And if you look at the ornament, they all tell a very different stories. It's all very meaningful and deep. According to a record from the Ki Pahai Foundation, the Chinese community entered Sukabumi in the 18th century as well. Most of them were plantation experts and merchants. They were held great sway in the economic sector. The first Chinese newspaper written in Malaya was published here. Along the way, they married local women and gave birth to many Chinese-Indonesian mixed children. They also gave rise to a fusion of cultures. The resulting mixture of culture becomes very important. And this time, we're going to take the culinary heritage of the unique acculturation. Chewy, sweet and melts in your mouth. Mochi. When you heard mochi, you probably think about Japan. No love. This is Indonesia's take on mochi and made exclusively here in Sukabumi. This place modernized the look and also the taste of mochi. They made 19 different variations of mochi flavor. Wow. Oh gosh, I don't know where to start. Let's taste it. This one is one of the best seller. This is mochi milo. So it's like mochi with milo filling. Milo is like milo powder. It's like chocolate powder. You don't know what milo is. Oh my god. The mochi actually has this mocha aroma in it. So it really blends very well with this chocolate powder mouth. Oh, I like this one. The production manager, Mr. Eman, has worked here since it first opened in 1983. He kindly led me to the kitchen to take a sneak peek on the production process. Much like any other variation of mochi, it is made from glutinous rice flour. Each day, they use 200 to 400 kilograms of glutinous rice flour. For original filling, they use 200 kilograms of peanuts for every production. Now we're entering the production room. 
The flour is mixed with water and turned to raw dough with the help of modern machinery. Then later, the dough would be cooked on a giant wok until it's sticky. Once it's cooked and sticky, it is then mixed again until it becomes smooth. Then come the artificial flavors and sugar syrup. No preservative are used to maintain the flavor, so everything here is fresh. Kenapa nggak pakai bahan pengawet? Kalau bahan basah cepat jamur. Apalagi dalam ikan kan panas. Kita makan udah aja. Jangan pakai pengawet. Asal konsumen udah tahu ketaratnya tiga hari. After the dough develop a silky smooth texture, they are then transferred to a tray and cooled off for two hours. Once they're completely cooled, they are covered with glutinous rice flours that was already cooked and dried. This is to prevent them from sticking to one another and prepares them to be cooked. Woo. If you see them carrying this so easy breezy, it's actually not. It's heavy. Also, it's actually very hot because it is fresh from the uh, dough mixer. So let's try to put this. Ah! Actually, I'm afraid I'm gonna mess this. I'm so gonna get fired. Each are cut vertically around 2 cm, then they are ready for the fun part, the packaging process. Each table is tossed to stuff them with different fillings. I want to try this offer malt filling. I can't believe how hard it is to make the right shape for one mochi ball. See, this is too small. This is too big. None of the mochi I made is in the right size. Look how fast they are at shaping the mochi. They keep records on who can shape the most mochi each day. So, Bang Apple over here, he can make 102 mochi in 5 minutes. 5 minutes. I try that, I spent 5 minutes making one and he can spend 5 minutes making 102. That is impressive. The last process is the packaging. For peanut filling, they are put in a bamboo straw box, but the other fillings, they are put in plastic box. Next time you eat a mochi, remember there are many loving hands involved. Oh. Voila! When you're in Sukabumi, you have to try bubur ayam bulat. Ale. There's another dish that was derived from Chinese chicken congee, but with an Indonesian spin on it. There are so many variations of bubur ayam in Indonesia, but the most notable ones are spread across West Java. One of them happened to be here in Sukabumi. If you don't believe me, check out Wikipedia. Bubur Sukabumi is technically the city's signature dish. The most famous buburayam restaurant, Bunut. It has been owned by Mr. Toi's family since 1981. Buburayam employs a wide range of poultry products, such as shredded chicken meat for the main dish and different dishes featuring chicken offal as the side delicacies. I got here pretty late, so they already ran out most of toppings. I can only get a quail egg satay. My advice, come down here early because this place is open at 6 in the morning. Wow, I cannot wait to eat this. So here's an interesting thing about Sukabumi chicken porridge or buburaya. It actually lays on its simplicity. They don't use too much topping. It's basically just um, some crackers and then there's chicken in it. And that's it. You can also add condiments. I like my bubur to be super spicy but a little bit sweet as well. So I'm adding chili sauce and a thin sweet soy sauce. I also love texture so I'm gonna crack more crackers. And this is the debatable part. I mix my bubur because it's the proper way to eat it. There are villains out there who refuses to mix their bubur. Yeah, I'm on to you. You're a monster.
I get here since I was a kid and now I came back here which I still do the same it's amazing this is more than just a breakfast to me this is a bowl of nostalgia reminds me of this Sunday with my family eating here together Bubur is always served hot and tender that's why bubur is known as a comfort food in the Indonesian culture. Moving on for some lunch, you can try a rice dish called nasi ungu or purple rice. You can find it at a restaurant called mami ungu. The purple color comes from red beet and purple yam, purple yam. The rice is made by cooking rice, soaking coconut milk instead of water, mixed with spices, then a red beet and yam are added to bring up the purple color. Purple rice is often served with galangal fried chicken, fried coconut flakes, fried potato in red chili sauce and urap, a salad made of steamed vegetable mixed with seasoned and spice grated coconut. They also serve it with the humble protein sauces, such as fried tempeh or tofu. Let's not forget the chili sauce or sambal too. It will either make or break the dish. They serve me not one, but two nasi ungu. This place, since it was opened in 2007 actually, the uh, quintessential menu is actually this, the nasi ungu special. Let me talk about the rice. The rice, I'm actually very excited about the rice because the thing is when you mix wheat, wheat can have that soil aroma to it. So I want to try whether this rice can actually eliminate that nasty taste from it. Okay, let's try the rice first. Just the rest. I can't smell or taste the beet soil flavor at all. It, it's, it's fantastic. It tastes really good. It tastes like nasi udu. And I'm not going to use this actually. I'm just going to use my hand. So if you one of those people who likes to be stimulated not just like by the taste but also by the look this purple rice is definitely something to try because it tastes good and also looks good and I want to go further and explore a Sukabumi sub-district called Gegerbitung. It is the location of a village called Chiengang, known for its coffee plantation. Nowadays, Sukabumi is famous for its tea plantation. But did you know, back in the 19th century, Sukabumi was renowned for its coffee production. Even up until now, ground coffee is still an important commodity for its people. You know, plantation like this, there are more than a thousands of hectares of coffee plantations spread across the district of Sukabumi. According to a data from the Sukabumi Department of Agriculture, local coffee is exported yearly to several countries like America, Belgium, New Zealand and the UAE. Out of at least 16 tons of Java Preanger coffee that was exported to Australia last year, five tons came from Sukabumi. The high altitude makes Sukabumi suitable for Arabica coffee. To taste coffee from the plantation, I visit a cafe called Bumi Kopi in Kadudampit. Danny, one of the employees, take me to the shady warehouse. <laughs> no, not to do Breaking Bad stuff, but to see how they roast their coffee. The coffee they use here comes from their several plantation, which are spread across several areas in Sukabumi. Then I met Rinaldi, the barista. 
A, kopi Sukabumi itu rasa khasnya apa? Yang pasti sih karakter khas kopi Jawa Barat pasti ada gula merah, kemarin, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. sama melati. Kenapa tuh? Karakter tanah mungkin ya, ah, yang bedain ya, jadi okay. kita sama ketinggian. Kalau ini yang lagi di brew ini apa ini jenisnya, varietasnya? Ini varietasnya Ateng, oh. ini prosesnya Hani. The cafe can be reached in around 20 minutes by car from the city center. It is near the Cijeruk Lake, which is a plus if you want to escape the crowd and enjoy the ambience of nature. Ah, no wonder those Europeans love to spend their retirement here in days gone by. So, can you picture yourself retiring in this quiet town like those European in colonial time did? <laughs> One thing for sure. You don't have to wait that long to visit Sukabumi and be enchanted by its own little charm. <laughs>